another episode of Power Move Makers. This series was created with a simple goal in mind, to bring to the table high-level executives, successful entrepreneurs, and just all-around inspiring human beings, not just focusing on their successes, but more important, shining a spotlight on the journey they took to get there. Now, this segment is our how-to segment. Within our how-to segment, I bring on guests who have excelled in particular industries and have deep dive conversations with them, trying to help you, our viewers, whether you're listening on podcast form or watching on video form, really I try to ask the questions that I think you would ask by experts, like my guest this week, Mr. Jose Rodriguez, the credit dude. Welcome to the show. Thanks a lot, man. I really appreciate you having me, Sean. Uh, it means a lot for you to, you know, have me speak to your audience, man, and, and I look forward to hopefully just educating the people today, man. Nah, thank you so much for the time. I appreciate it. I know you're a busy man. You're working, number one, with your business, and you're side-by-side side with a good friend of mine, um, Envy, and you guys are doing big things, so thanks for taking the time out. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Okay. Before we get into, and I got a few credit questions for you, and, and the way I try to do this is I just try to ask questions that I think I would want to know um, and okay. the average person would want to know. So okay. before we get into it, you were in the Marines, correct? Yes, sir. Yep. First off, thank you for your service. Thank you. Appreciate how, that. How long did you serve? Uh, about six and a half years, almost wow. close to seven years. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Nice. Yeah. How does a Marine go from being a soldier in service? I mean, I guess mm -hmm. credit repair is a form of service. Yeah. How does that transition happen? So what's crazy is, you know, I used to be ashamed of it before, but when I was in the Marines, you know, I got court-martialed when I was in. So I'm not sure if you know my story with that. No, you I know, don't. I, I, I got court-martialed when I was in for, uh, you know, for committing fraud. I was a recruiter when I was in the Marines. So... You know, I was serving my community, did something I wasn't supposed to do. I followed the crowd and, you know, I ended up serving, serving time in a military prison in the brig. And I think that was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. It was, it was, it was what I needed because I would always make excuses uh, in my life. Oh, I didn't have a dad. Oh, I didn't have this. I came up from there. But then my military career was something that I did. I, I did it and I messed it up. You know what I mean? And, and, and unfortunately, it was the best thing that I did because it taught me that you can't follow the crowd and that you can't do what other people are doing because at one point in time, when it comes down to it, you're going to be the only one that's getting in trouble. And that's what happened. That's you know right. what I mean? So, so for years I struggled with depression. I trouble, I struggled with PTSD, you know, struggled with a lot of mental, you know, mental illness as a result of what I did. And um, I always felt like if I couldn't be a Marine and I couldn't serve like my country, that I was, I was worthless and that I couldn't do anything. But, you know, another for, you, you, you know how you people say, unfortunately, I always say fortunately, because I, I, I always look for the good and the bad experiences. So fortunately, my dad, me and my dad share the same name. So he messed up my credit when I was in the military. You know what I mean? We share the same name. So his stuff went on my credit report. He, you know, applied for some stuff, whatever. So we're the same name. And in the military, you need security clearance. You have, like, in order for you to get a certain job in the Marines, you have to have a certain security clearance so that way you can be cleared to do that job. So I did a little bit of credit repair while I was in the military, helped a couple of people out. When I got out the Marines, people knew I, had, people knew I got court-martialed, but they knew who I was. And they were like, hey, I remember you helped my friend back in Japan, back in California. He's going for a security clearance. I need your help. You know, can you help him fix his credit? And I'm like, yeah, why not? I didn't make any money out of it. I just did a couple of things here and there. And then um, I looked at it as an opportunity where, okay, I might not be able to serve my country again as a Marine, but I can serve my community with helping them become homeowners, serving my community with helping them understand credit, giving them the guidance that I didn't know because my dad stole, you know, I, I wouldn't say he stole my credit. He just, you know, we had the same name. So it was like, I didn't know that at 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. So I was like, you know what? I can still be that Marine and serve my community with credit and be that leader and that authority. So that's how it transitioned for me. And, and I, it literally got me out of my depression. It got me out of my 
my slump. You know, I was married. I have a daughter. And I didn't want to get out of bed. And credit repair literally was, was that tool that fixed me in, in a way, if that makes sense. Oh, wow. I want to go backwards before I go forward. Mm -hmm. And I had no yep. intent of, of yep. diving in because I, I, I didn't know this part of your story. Yep. Number one, I want to bring out some gems that you said. Mm -hmm. You know, for anybody who's watching this, it, it's something I push all the time. Mm -hmm. Trust the process. Yep. You, I don't care how bad things are. I don't care what your circumstances are. I don't care what environment you come from. Right. There is, you know, God put you in these positions for a reason. Absolutely. You might not know it in real time, but just to hear you say, look, Sean, at the time I used to be embarrassed about it, and now I own it. Yep. You didn't really, th th that experience is what has helped you to now become the man that you've become. And I love that. So trust the process. And number two, you have to own your stuff. Like it's easy to blame the world. It's easy to tell people the reason that I'm not successful or the reason that I am not in this place in life that I want to be in is because of at my education or because of my mom or because of whatever. No, this is your life. Yep. Own it all across the board and you will see that once you own it, those very things that you thought were holding you back will now become the jet fuel to push you forward. So thanks for being so open and honest about your story. Um, one Absolutely. question before we move on. Did your dad, I know you guys shared the same name, mm -hmm. but did he deliberately use your information or was it just by accident because Jose, Jose Rodriguez is a pretty common name? I, I don't know. You know, to be honest, my dad says he didn't, um, but both of my brothers had kind of like similar experiences than I did. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm going to take it for, for, you know, as a great, you know, for what it's worth and say that he didn't do it deliberately just so that way, um, one, he doesn't feel like he owes me anything or I feel like I don't owe him anything and just own it. Like, listen, we share the same name. I can't go on the rest of my life saying, oh, you have my name, so I'm never going to get ahead. So it, it was actually what got me into credit repair. So it was actually a blessing in disguise. Yep. And, and he actually told me one day, he's like, listen, since I messed your credit up, he's like, don't I, owe, don't I, don't I owe, uh, deserve like 10% of your company or something like that? And I was like, man, get out of here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Get out of here. So, yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Okay, so is... Fixing credit repair. Is this your mm -hmm. full-time job now? Is this what you do for a living? Day in, day out, 16 to 18 hours a day. So yep. you, you're, you're in the, ex, you know, just before we move on, just for, this, mm -hmm. for, for the sake of our audience, you are yep. an expert in this area. Yes. I've been trained for years on with the top credit experts. Um, you know, I don't want to drop their name. I mean, I can, but I've been trained I've been training in credit repair. I started my company in 2010. I started taking classes in 2011 nationwide. And ever since been training with the top credit uh, experts. I used to work at the credit bureaus. We have about 14 employees now as well. So it's not just my nine to five or whatever you want to call it, but I also have employees and people that this is their main job as well. Got gotcha. you. Um, so it's fair to say you've been doing this for no less than 10 years. Correct. Okay. Uh, give me an idea of the services that your company offers. So the first thing I usually, I always tell people that I, I want people to understand what we do is we want you to understand your credit. It, it's, it's one thing to, to, to pay someone and say, Hey, fix my credit. Unfortunately, you might be in the same position a year from now, two years from now. So it, it's kind of like hiring a painter and a painter showing you exactly how to paint your house. That's kind of like what we do. We want you to hire us, but we're going to show you how your credit score is calculated, what it takes to raise your credit score, what it takes to get a higher credit limit, um, and understand what it takes to pretty much take your credit to the next level and get approved for a low interest rate because Credit repair, it's, it's, I mean, I'm not down uh, or like downplaying my industry. It's not rocket science, but 
what we do is more than credit repair because it's, it's more giving you the tools that you need to empower yourself. So that way you can then go to your, your family, your sister, your friends in college, your, your, your fellow Marines, your fellow, you know, people in college, like we want to empower you. So that way when somebody brings up credit, you can just boom at the top of your mouth, at the top of your head and say, Oh yeah, 720 FICO score. Oh yeah, to get approved for a house, you need boom, boom, boom. Oh yeah, credit line increase is this. These are the no-nos. It's like, so we do a lot of videos with our clients. We do weekly webinars with our clients where we're just boom, educating, 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 because that's the difference of what we do is, yeah, I can fix your credit, but if you don't understand that 35% of your credit score is payment history, which is 192.5 points, you're not going to, try to make a late payment in the future because some people are like, ah, eh, it's just one late payment. Yeah, but one late payment can take you from a 720 down to a 580. You know what I mean? So it's like, that's where we try to tell people like, Let, let's educate you so you can understand how credit truly works. And then you could just use us as a guide and, and then yeah, we'll fix your credit, but we'll get you to that next level. Okay, I love what you said. In addition to helping people to fix their credit, you, t you take it a step further with your agency. You mm -hmm. guys are educating Correct. throughout the process. So yep. if Sean comes to you for your service, when I leave, I'm kind of a pseudo expert myself. I can go and help my sister or one of my brothers out to fix their credit. Is that correct? Correct. To, with, with, with the, I mean, pretty much with, to the extent of without having to really dispute anything. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we still dispute everything for our clients on their behalf, but more so like the education. Like, so like, let's say today, today, September 3rd, somebody uh, signs up for our company. We have a Facebook group with thousands of people. They have already right there over a hundred videos of stuff that we've done webinars on. So we always tell our clients, Hey, when you, when you first come in part of your requirement, like this is, it's kind of like you hire a personal trainer. Your, your personal trainer says you got to do this, 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 and this. So when our clients come in, we say, all right, look in, in the Facebook group because we have over 100 videos. We have Facebook posts. We have all this stuff that you now need to learn. You need to now put your homework in and put the time in because if not, you're just going to be like, oh, I didn't learn anything. Like, no, you got to watch the videos and our clients love it. You know, it does, it's time consuming a little bit, but you can just listen to the, you know, like how people are listening to this. Put the video on, you know, drive in your car. Or, or put a podcast on and just listen to it. And, and that's where we like to educate people because now we can touch people all over the nation versus just in New Jersey. Before we move further, what's the name of your company? Got Credit. Got Credit. There you go. So, and I, and I wanted to, to uh, speak about the name of your company before we go further. So if anybody who's listening and they want, and, and we'll, you know, revisit this at the end of this interview. But for anybody who's listening who doesn't make it to the end, please go and um, check Jose out at Got Credit because it sounds like you're offering some really unique services. You yes, know, sir. I have personally gone through some of these um, service companies to help fix my credit in the past. And I've never had the opportunity or, or I was never offered the service of watching videos and being part of these Facebook calls and, you know, all the different things that you just spoke about. So I think it's ingenious. I think it's, uh, I think it's something that so many people would want to, to take part in. So I, I love that you're doing that. Thank you. Let's talk about COVID. Mm -hmm. You know, COVID, a lot of people are destroying their credit during this whole COVID period. How can people, number one, protect their credit? And then talk to me. I know um, Trump formed the Trump Cares Act, if I got it correct. Yep. I don't know if that's still in place. If it is, how long is it in place? So yep. let's take it step by step. What are some things that people can do to just protect their credit during COVID? And then talk to me about the Trump Cares Act yep. and how that can help people. And if it's still in effect, and if so, how long? So I always tell people the first thing you want to do is, which is kind of like what you do in any type of relationship, right? If there's open communication in any relationship, it's going to be a better relationship, right? So if you have, if you're married, if you have an employer, 
if you have a, you know, a friend, you communicate. The more you communicate and the more you're understanding and the more you tell, the better. So the same thing with your creditors during this pandemic. I've been in business 10 years, never seen this happen where creditors are saying, oh, you can't pay? You know what? Let's put you on a, on, on a, on a few months deferment. Let's go ahead and give you a few months. Let's waive your late fees. And it's all because of what I'm going to touch on with the CARES Act. I've never seen it before. It could be, hey, I'm, I'm struggling to pay my bills because I lost my job because of this. They're like, all right, well, you're still going to be late on your credit report. So now your credit is going to be dinged. And right now with the CARES Act, which was passed, I believe, in like March time frame, mm -hmm. um, it protects any negative reporting on your credit report as long as you make an agreement with your creditors and you uphold that agreement and those conditions as to what you state. So let's say if you have a credit card, Capital One, and you, you know, everything happened with COVID and you can use, there's still time because I'm going to, I'm going to go over the cover period too. You can say, Hey, listen, I've been out of work since, since February, since March, since April, and, and I'm affected by COVID. You know, I'm sorry that I didn't call you sooner. You know, I was a little embarrassed. Be upfront. I was a little embarrassed. I was afraid, whatever. I thought I was going to get my job back, but you know, I haven't been able to make my payments in the last four months. Is there, you know, I was reading up on the CARES Act and reading up online that there's some protections in place for me as a consumer because I'm out of work and because I was effective. They're going to be like, oh, well, how are you affected? Well, I lost my job. Okay, so you have less income. Yes. All right, well, you know what we're going to do? I'm going to, rent, I'm going to run this up to my management team because now we're in September. Mm -hmm. Back in April, you would prevent the late payments. But now in September, we got to kind of like backtrack and get those late payments off. So it, it takes a simple phone call where you can call your credit card company up, your auto loan company, mortgage company and say, hey, listen, I didn't take advantage of any deferments back then because I thought I was going to get my job. But can you look in the system and see if I'm eligible, which is the keyword eligible for any type of deferment or any type of hardship program because my credit is very important to me. And the last thing I want is because of a, a, a global pandemic that I'm not responsible for to now hurt my credit. And usually, as long as you do that, it's just like any relationship. You own up, just like you said in the beginning, if you own what you did and just say, hey, I'm sorry. The person on the other line is just somebody just like you and me. They're going to be understanding. And if they say no, then say, all right, well, I understand. And I, and I thank you for taking the time. But can I speak to your management and maybe speak to somebody in upper upper level to see if they could actually help me out? Because, you know, my credit is very important to me. And I don't think that I should be held at, you know, be liable for me losing my job because of this. Like this has happened in the restaurant industry here in New Jersey. And, and I'm sure you're familiar with in New York, a lot of restaurants, bars, you know, they, they all lost their jobs, you know? Yep. So we literally, um, I think it was like about 350 clients that we took for free uh, during the whole pandemic that worked. Like if you were in one of those industries, I lost your job completely. Uh, and then we educated them. Like we helped them save their credit. So we didn't necessarily need to do so much credit repair with them. It was more, protection like be a little bit proactive but now in september you got to be reactive if you didn't call your credit or creditors already and with the cares act the great thing is like i said i've never seen this that's why people need to make sure that they're they're jumping on it the covered period with the cares act is 120 days of when the president says there's no longer a pandemic 120 days after that. So let's say if he says October, no more pandemic, the covered period with the CARES Act is 120 days after. So you're, you're covered in a sense for a really, really long time. But if you don't call your creditors, they're going to mark you late. Like it's not an automatic, you know, not reporting. You have to call, you have to contact your creditors, you know, creditors, auto loan, mortgages, things like that. And, and then, if they give you like a three to four month grace period, then you have to be in contact with them. Remember communication and say, Hey, I know I'm coming up on my three to four month mark, but I'm going to need some more time. You know, I just started working again. I, my money, you know, I had to get another job and I wasn't making as much as I was before. Is there anything you can do to see if I'm eligible for another deferment, another extension, another forbearance, something like that. You know what I mean? Because if not, they're not going to automatically do it. And you're going to have to hire someone like me, to, to, to get it off. But the only thing that is automatic, Sean, is student loans. Federal student loans, they're automatically deferred until December 20, uh, I think. So now January 2021 is when then uh, the payments start back up again. That's the only thing that was automatic, student loans, federal student loans. Got you. Just to, to 
because this is so crazy, me being on the other side. And like you said, this is the first time that you have ever seen this done. If Sean has defaulted on some payments, there is a chance if I call a credit card company or I call whoever I owe money to, mm -hmm. look, I fell on some hard times and I'm just honest with them. There's, there's not only a chance that they will listen to me, but that negative mark that has hit my, hit my credit report, I can actually have it removed? Correct. Wow. Correct. And the covered period, which is another great thing. Remember I mentioned 120 days after? Mm -hmm. It's actually covered. Um, it starts in January. So remember, COVID didn't happen until March. That where everything happened. But the covered period in the CARES Act is January 2020 up until 120 days after the pandemic. So you can kind of get a little bit, you know, uh, not tricky, but a little bit, I guess you can say, like, use it to your advantage. If you have a late payment in February and you truly were affected by COVID, then call your credit card company up and see if you can get that removed too. But my always thing is if you weren't affected by COVID, if you still had a job if you, and you just made a late payment, like I always tell people, just be honest. Don't try to like use something that's available for people that actually need the help yep. and try to be sneaky. That's what I meant to say. Don't be sneaky about it and try to like, oh, I was affected by COVID because they're going to say, oh, well, um, did you lose your job? No. Or yes, I did. And, and you can lie. You know what I mean? There's just, just don't lie about it. Just be honest. But once again, if you just call them and say, hey, I heard there's a CARES Act. It, what's what am I eligible for? Can I get these late payments off? I really want, you know, I've been with you guys since 2015. I've never had a late payment. And, and that's the other big thing. If you've had a credit card for four years and you were late every month or, or you've shown history of being late every month, you can't use COVID as an excuse because they're going to be like, well, actually we looked at your account and we saw that you actually were late for several months before COVID. So unfortunately, you know, we, we might be able to just take one or two late payments. But if you have good history, good payment history, and they see that in fact, the late payment started around COVID, they're not, the chances are they're not going to ask any questions and they're just going to grant you the, the removals and you'll be good. And that could be a difference of a hundred points, 120 points. And, and remember credit is all, it messes with your mind. So if you see a low credit score, it's going to put you into a funk, yep. especially during these times. So you definitely use these tools to your advantage and, and all, and all it takes is this right here? Your phone, pick it up, call them, and 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 see what you could do. One point I want to reiterate before we move on: you said that this CARES Act is in effect 120 days after the president says that there is no longer a pandemic. Correct. That could literally be a year from now. Yeah. It, it, does this cross? Because we're in election season. Mm -hmm. Will this cross? into the next presidency or is it only with the trump presidency no it's 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 the cares act it's more pretty much it's an amend so the cares act had a bunch of um had a bunch of like clauses or a bunch of changes mm -hmm. the change that this was it's it's to the fair credit reporting act so that's a federal statute so it's a federal law so even though you know president trump and congress passed it it can transfer over until the next, you know, you know, if, if Trump the doesn't get elected again, it, it, because now it's a federal statute. It's not, you know, it, it's not like something that he's doing on its own. It's, it's the Fair Credit Reporting Act that was amended as a result of the CARES Act. And that's what, that's the clause that was, that was put in the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Now, once the pandemic is over, that clause in a sense, it's, it's still there but it's removed and people can reference it down, you know, back in the day. Cause I, I, I know that people are going to be able to use this to their advantage once the, the pandemic is over. You know what I mean? So just keep that in mind. That, that's a great question. Cause I, I've only had one other person ask me that. So that's a great question. Very great question. Got you. Okay. General question. Mm -hmm. What is considered a good credit score? Like what should we all be shooting for? Yep. So I would say, you know, pre-COVID, post-COVID, now, I always tell people 700 is, is really where you want to be. Um, 700 credit score. So you start at 300 and you go all the way to 850 
you have 550 points that are um, broken down into five categories. I know I touched on one of them, payment history, 35%. The other one's 30% payment, uh, that's debt utilization. So that's the credit card balances that we have. So a 700 credit score typically will, will mean when a bank sees your credit score, that you have really one, maybe one or two late payments. You have low debt utilization and, and really not a lot of negative stuff. So that's why a 700 is good because now if you want to get a house, if you want to get a car, a business loan, a private student loan, maybe you want to get a loan to open up a food truck, whatever the case is, if you're at that 700 sweet spot, you're pretty much good all over. Like not just for a mortgage because, you know, you can get a mortgage with like a 580 credit score. You know what I mean? I don't suggest it. I, I always tell people, you have a 580, do not buy a mortgage because there's other underlying issues there. So 700 will put you in a really good place with every single lender that you try to apply for. Okay, great. Before I go further, you said 850 is the top credit score, correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. Has, does anybody have an 850? Can you even achieve that number? Yeah, so the guy that trained me, his name is John Alzheimer. Uh, he's only one of two guys that I've ever seen with an 850 credit score. Um, the other guy that I seen with an 850 was one of the guys that I met at the uh, Caesar and Envy seminar last year. Mm -hmm. um, and it definitely is attainable. You got to have really, really good positive payment history, no late payments, like 1%, 2% debt utilization, where if you have like $100,000 in credit cards, available credit, you could only usually have like 1% or 2%, maybe like one or two inquiries. You know, you didn't want to see like a house. You know, they want to see like maybe like a diversified type of payments or whatever the case is and a long history. Like if you're 18, you're not gonna have an 800. You might have a, a 640 because you're just starting out. But if, if you have a long credit profile and an old credit profile, that's gonna get you closer to that 800, 850 mark. Got you. On average, mm -hmm. if I come see you tomorrow, how long does it take to fix my credit? Like what should I be bracing myself for? Or is there an average? So I would say normal to be safe just because obviously, you know, we don't promise anything. That's one of the things that we don't do. We don't promise our clients like, hey, one month, two months. To be on the safe side, we tell them, look, six to nine months because it's kind of like I revert everything to personal training because um, my best friend is a personal trainer. It's very funny how similar credit repair and personal training actually are, are very similar. So when, when you go to a personal trainer, and you want to change your lifestyle and change your eating, it's not going to take a month. It's not going to take two months. It might take five to six months to start working out, drinking water, eating right. And then you, cause you might see results in a month and then month two, you go back to your old ways. So same thing with credit repair. You have to brace yourself where, all right, I have to be strict. I have to make sure I don't overspend on anything that, you know, if, all right, if I'm buying Jordans all the time, let me stop doing that. If I'm eating out all the time, I got to stop. If I'm always on Fashion Nova, if I'm always going to the mall, if I'm always on DoorDash, I got to stop. And that then saves up some money because during credit repair, you are going to have to pay off some debt, you know? Not everything gets wiped out. So if you have a credit card from four years ago and we're not able to delete it, we're like, hey, listen, there's a $500 credit card. Let's see if we can settle for 350. Well, if you've been tightening up your spending the last couple months, now that 350 is not going to be a problem. And now you're in the sense, you're paying off debt, but you're investing in your credit score. A lot of people don't realize a credit score is an investment, not credit repair, not credit. Your credit score, you're investing in. So a lot of people look at the stock market, they see the numbers go up and down. That's all that they care about, the numbers, right? The credit score is the same thing. It's a number that you invest in either by, discipline with with making sure you're on time and, and low utilization but then also paying down debt that can't be deleted because even if we delete let's say we delete everything from your credit report right completely everything is deleted we wipe your clean clean slate now you have no credit you have to now apply for maybe a secure credit card a credit builder loan and that's going to take money you know you a secure credit card is 200 dollars right there a My Jewelers Club, which we recommend to clients, is a $5,000 account. That's another $200 right there. So you have to be ready mentally and also spending-wise. You got to cut a lot of stuff out. You know what I mean? When I first started fixing my own credit, 
I had to stop doing a lot of stuff because I had to pay some stuff off, get some things settled, and then also invest in credit cards and stuff like that. So six to nine months, I would say, is a very, very good sweet spot to be able to help you with educating you and transforming yourself. So that way, if I fix your credit in three months, I don't want to see you seven months down the road. I want to, I want to, in a year, I want you to tell me, hey, man, through your program, I was able to help three of my cousins out. They got their credit cards. Now they got 750 and we're all going to buy some investment property together. You know what I mean? So that's why it does take a little bit longer with our program. Okay. You keep using credit report, credit score. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? So your credit score is driven by your credit report. So you have a credit report and you have data that's on your credit report. So you have your name, you have your address, you have uh, employment history. That doesn't affect your credit score, but it's how they identify your credit report, right? Now you have your credit card loan, your credit cards that you've paid or haven't paid, collection accounts, you have your mortgage, your auto loans, student loans. That's all reported by the companies that you have an agreement with and they now report all that data to the credit reporting agencies, Equifax, Experian, TransUnion. Now you have a fight, you have FICO. FICO now has an algorithm that calculates the data on your credit report and now comes up with the credit score. So if you have late payments, which is negative data, you have collections, that's going to drive a low credit score. If you have good data, which is low utilization, on-time payments, not a lot of inquiries, that's gonna drive a higher credit score. And what's crazy is a credit score is a three-digit number, right? FICO score, you have a Vantage score, you have a couple different credit scores out there, but it's all an indication of what the, like, what the risk is and what the predictability is of you being 90 days late or more. Uh, I, mean, I mean, you being late within the next 90 days, I'm sorry. You know what I mean? So it's like, it, it's like a risk, you know, with insurance, you have like, you know, and people like assess you like, oh, you're, you know, we can't insure you because you're too much of a risk. Well, the credit score is really just the risk of how likely you are to be late in the future. You know what I mean? So it's kind of broken down a little bit, like at the five categories. So it, it, it is a little bit tricky um, to just make sure that if you have good data, you're going to have a good credit score. Got you. You mentioned FICO. Mm -hmm. What is FICO in layman terms? And also, if I got this correct, they just came out with FICO 10 or FICO 10T. What exactly is that amendment? Yep. So you have Fair Isaac Corporation. That's the that's the pretty much what FICO stands for. It's pretty much a company, um, you know, started by two guys, and it's it's pretty much the people that control or or, or own the monopoly on credit scores, right? So FICO. Hold, 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 hold on. Yeah. I, I, I've been hearing about FICO my whole life, it seems like. Yep. FICO is privately owned? This is not government owned? No, it's private owned. Holy smoke. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. That, yep. You, you just educated me because I thought that this was something that the federal government had yeah. in place. Yeah, it's, it's, it's owned by two guys. They started it and it's not really... Um, like you and me right now can say, you know what, I want to come up with a credit score too. And as long as the banks appeal to it, they'll start using it. You know what I mean? Because if, if it makes sense to them to, to predict risk, then, then they'll use it. So FICO, there's a lot of models out there. There's, there's FICO 2, FICO 4, and FICO 5, which is currently being used by the mortgage industry. So that's why, Sean, when you see Credit Karma score, Mm -hmm. It's a lot different from your mortgage score or what other lenders see is because it's all different algorithms, all different models. So the fight. So think about it. You just mentioned FICO 10 and FICO 10 T mortgage companies are still using FICO two, four and five. <laughs> so it's like, they're not changing that. That's like a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac thing where the mortgage companies are still going to be using FICO two, four and five. Um, there's FICO eight, FICO nine, and as FICO 10, as you mentioned, um, FICO 10T stands for trending data. So what FICO 10T is, is it also takes into account of how your past spending was. So one of the things that myself included uh, would tell people is, hey, right when you're getting ready to buy a house, just pay your credit card debt down. Your score will shoot right back up and you'll be good. But they're going to eventually incorporate FICO 10T into some scoring models where they're going to say, 
um, yeah, your FICO 10 T score is low because all that you did was just, you've had maxed out credit cards for two years and you just paid them right now to get this mortgage. That's still a risk to us because we might think that you might get this mortgage or get this, this, this product and then max your credit cards out again. So that's what the 10 T stands for, is for trending data. Got you. You mentioned Credit Karma. Let's talk about that. Yep. When I was growing up, we were always taught, don't, you know, you don't want any inquiries, even yourself. I think at the time you get to make one inquiry per year to check on your credit score and see what's happening there. With Credit Karma, they push the fact that it doesn't affect your credit score. Is that accurate? No. So let me rephrase that. You checking your own credit with Credit Karma doesn't affect. That is correct. That is correct. Checking your own credit with Credit Karma or annualcreditreport.com or any credit monitoring company that you got to pay a subscription to will not affect your credit. And I actually advocate for people to pay a subscription to monitor their credit versus Credit Karma because Credit Karma is free. You get what you pay for. But before I mentioned there's Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, right? Yep. Credit Karma does not monitor Experian. So you're missing one of the credit reports, which Experian's a pretty, it's a pretty big deal. You know, Experian's one of the big credit reports, you know, American Express checks them when they approve people, Chase. And when you go for a mortgage, they check all three, they don't check two. So if you're just monitoring your credit with Credit Karma, you, you might be missing something that's negative on there or not reporting at all that can cause issues down the road. Got you. So just for my clarity, mm -hmm. Credit Karma, you get what you pay for, but if I look at my own credit, it is not negatively affecting my credit score. Correct. Let's say I don't have enough money to pay you or pay any service out there. Mm -hmm. Can I fix my credit on my own, number one? Number two, are there form letters or templates available to people you know, who just don't have it to go and download and maybe send off to Visa or MasterCard or whoever you've been late with? And if so, where would I find these form letters? Yep, so I always tell people, and we actually advocate, which is why we focus so much on education, is to fix your own credit. You know, we actually tell people, listen, if you could fix your own credit, we, we want you to do that. But on the other hand, I want to I want to cut my own hair and and, and, and I don't because <laughs> I'll, I'll you know I I'll chip myself up. You know, I want to do my own tattoo, but I can't. You know, I want to mow my own grass, but my wife won't let me. So it's like there's a lot of things we can do on our own, Sean. Uh fixing credit is actually one of those is actually a right as a consumer. We like I said, we advocate for that. Um but it it, it depends on when I did it by myself when I was in the military when I got out, it took me like 2 3 years to fix it. And then once I started learning and learning the laws and learning, you know, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, the Truth in Lending Act, there's all these acts out there that protect us as consumers. And that's what I do day in and day out. And there's other, you know, as a credit repair company, that's what we do day in and day out. So, it, yeah, you could do it. We just might do it a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. Not saying we we'll do it better because that would be lying if we say we're doing it better. It's just a little bit faster. And we just have a little bit more experience, a little bit more expertise couple more years of training and, and that's it. And, and if people want to do it on their own, we are actually looking to do like a do it yourself kit down the road. We're actually going to launch that 2021. Um, but I mean, if you just Google, go on Google and just, you know, a uh, template letter, just remember you're, there's thousands of people Googling, uh, downloading those letters. So the credit bureaus and the creditors are going to know that it's a template. So just make sure change the verbiage up a little bit. But like I said before, the best thing that can, you can do, is your phone. If you have late payments, collections, things like that, just call you. It's going to take you time. You know what I mean? Call each creditor up, see what deal you can do. Call each collection agency up, see if they can do like a, a, an agreement where if you pay them, they delete it from your credit report, establish new credit, and you'll be good. You, you know, you're still going to come out of pocket a little bit as far as with what you pay to settle, but then you don't got to pay a, a credit repair companies like me, uh, you know, as for the service, you know? Got you. Um, the, the, the three big ones, TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian, are they? Yes, sir. Yep. 
these guys don't, they work independent of one another, correct? Yes. So when fixing your credit, it is, you know, if I'm on the other side and I'm hiring a company like yourself, should I take for granted that you guys are working with all three of these agencies? Or is it my job to make sure that, you know, if I have something on TransUnion, but it's not on Equifax, that you guys go and address it with TransUnion? Correct. <laughs> yep, we actually address it with the person or the creditor um, that is supposed to be reporting it. So let's say if you have a Macy's credit card, it's in uh -huh. good standing, you've had it for three years, and for whatever reason, it's not an Equifax, it's on Experian TransUnion, what we would do is we would write a letter on your behalf to Macy's and say, hey, I've noticed that you're not reporting my account to Equifax. This is hurting my credit score because I'm not getting the positive payment history that I should be. So can you please update my credit report within 30 days to reflect this account being reported? We always say do that in writing because if you call somebody over the phone, there's really no, yeah, yeah there's phone calls or whatever, but it's always better to do that in writing. Um, that's, that's really a quick fix. That's, that's a quick fix to, uh, to call the, the creditor up. But you don't want to call the credit bureaus because if you call the credit bureaus or, or contact them, they're just going to revert you back to the person that's supposed to be reporting that information. And, okay, and so that's a great point. Credit. That's a great point. Yeah. Don't even waste your time with the credit bureaus. Nope. Go to the people who you're in default with, the actual companies. Yep. Well, if you're in default, so, so is, it, is it an account that's in default or is it an account that is in good standing? Because that, that, that makes a big difference. If you're in default... You don't, you know, and it's only on two bureaus, you, you know, you're, you're, you're good. You know, you don't want them to report it to the third one, you know, so it really just depends on if the account is negative or in a good standing. Got you. Um, say I'm in the process of cleaning up my credit. How can I build good credit at the same time? And I ask this because people wonder, right? Like, if, if I am now... You let's say I hired you. You guys got some of my past um, infractions taken off my credit report. When should I go and start applying for new credit? Like, is there a time window I should wait for? If I start applying, does it hurt me and bring my score back down lower and and really negate all of the work that you guys have done for me? Like, what? How can I build my credit while in the process of repairing it? So we, we allow or we advise clients to do it day one. So the reason why you want to do it day one is because if you go through our credit repair program six months and then, or any credit repair program for that matter, six to nine months, and then build credit at that point, you, you've wasted six to nine months of positive payment history that you could have had with getting some credit builder cards. So one of the accounts that we recommend um, you ever heard of like Finger Hut? Of course. So there's two similar. We used to recommend Finger Hut, not anymore, just because their limits are low and a lot of clients were complaining about their fees or whatever the case is. So there's a similar account to, to Finger Hut, which is called uh, My Jewelers Club and New Coast Direct. So, these, so My Jewelers Club and New Coast Direct. Uh, these are two accounts that are very similar to Finger Hut where we could only purchase products on their website. But the great thing is, Sean, is that they each give you $5,000 limit each. So now for $200 a pop, with, so for 400 bucks, you now can park and place $10,000 of credit on your credit report. Whereas Finger Hut might only give you like 350 a secure credit card, if you give them 200, they're just putting $200 on your credit report. So it's like the minute you use $150, now your credit score goes down because you're affecting that 30% utilization, right? So if you take the, the $400 and maybe one month spend 200 to get the My Jewelers Club, the next month get the new Coast Direct, now, yeah, you're out of, you're, you're, I wouldn't say you're out 400, you're investing 400. So that way now you have $10,000 in credit and credit card limits. We delete some negative stuff. Now, when you're going to apply for a regular credit card, like Capital One, American Express, Chase, 
you know, good credit cards, they're not going to give you a $300 limit. They're going to give you $4,000, $5,000, $8,000 because you've already demonstrated that you have low utilization with those two credit cards that we told you to get in the beginning of the credit repair process. You have low utilization. You have a less negative items, low inquiries. So now it's, it's all about playing the game where it's like, all right, I have high credit limits. So now you're going to go to like a jewelry, a jewelry, a regular jewelry store or, or, or let's say Wayfair. You got to buy furniture, Home Depot. They're not going to give you a $300 limit. They're going to give you a high limit. So that's why we tell people to start in the beginning, because if you wait until the end and you have no credit and then you apply for a secure credit card or something else, they're only going to give you like 300, 350, 500. You know, that's not, you know, that's maybe like credit repair early 2000s. You know what I mean? But now there's a lot of companies out there that say, hey, you just got to give me a little bit more money and I'll give you a high limit that you could only use on my website. But I tell people don't max it out, leave the utilization low, use it one time, pay it off. And now you have $10,000 with zero balance and no negative items. That's such great information. Yeah. Um, it, it, it made me think of a couple of things. Number one, will these companies that you just referred, say my credit is 585. Mm -hmm. it, can I get it with not the greatest credit yep. um, score? Number one. And well, let's start there because I had a second question, but I want to hear the answer to that. Yes, you can. I, I always tell people as long as you have a pulse, you're fine. Like these credit card companies, the My Jewelers Club and New Coast Direct, they usually uh, require like a 500 credit score minimum. And I've never, it's very rare that I see under a 500. At that time, I wouldn't advise the client to apply yet. Mm -hmm. um, but usually as long as they have a 500 credit score, they'll approve, you know, they, they don't have like a thousand or 2000. It's 5,000 for everybody. So as long as you have a 500 credit score, they'll usually you will be approved. Correct. Okay, and my second question to that was, do other companies out there know the game? Are they, are they looking and saying, oh, you just got credit with, um, and, and the, 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 the two companies you named, the names escape me, and I apologize. But mm -hmm. then, you know, say I go to somebody reputable now, and look, like, look, I got $10,000 in credit over here. I've only used maybe 1,000 on each one of these cards, so... I have very low debt. Will somebody reputable now take a chance on me? Or do they just look at it and be like, nah, we know the game. You went to them. They, they approve anybody who has a credit score above 500. So don't, don't come over here with that. Yep. It's great, great, great question. I get that, I get that question a lot. Um, and it's a great question because they're not going to care. And the reason why they're not going to care is when they run your credit, or when you apply with like American Express or Chase or somebody else, it's all online. It's automated. Nobody's really looking at your credit report. They're just caring about your credit score and what other factors that are affecting your credit score by the data that's being reported. So if you apply for American Express and you have a 720 credit score because you have the two $5,000 accounts and it's My Jewelers Club and New Coast Direct, they're not going to care that it's those two accounts. They're just going to be more worried about that you have low utilization and positive payment history and a seven plus credit score. Um, and that's where you want to be. That's the great thing about these cards and why we stopped recommending finger hut because they're going to give you 10 grand between both cards. And that's going to put you in a whole nother bracket to be able to get approved for other cards. So in a sense, you're using these as a tool to, to get what else you got to get next. But the great thing is, Sean, is they don't really look at it and say, oh, these are my jewelers club. Nah, we're not going to approve you. This is, these, these are credit builder cards. They don't look at it that way, which is great. That's amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. Yep. Um, what's a good credit to debt ratio for any one of us to have? So I would say playing it safe is 10 to 30%, right? Because if you have anything over 50%, debt utilization, you're in a sense affecting the, the so 30% of your credit score is the debt utilization, right? That's 165 points. So you could have a 600 
or a 765. Like the 765 obviously looks better because that means that you have low debt. So the lower debt you have, or the, or I'm sorry, the higher debt you have, the closer to that 600 you're going to be going down. So if you're at 50%, you might be like at a 680, right? If you pay it 30%, you might be close to seven. If you're at 10% debt utilization, you might be like at a 710, 730. You know what I mean? So it's like the lower you go, the better. I always advocate as much as you can if you have the means and, and, and you really put everything you can into getting your debt down, I would say 10% or lower is where you want to be. So if you have $10,000 in overall credit available, you really don't want to be over $1,000 a month. You know what I mean? You want to keep it, try to keep it under a thousand because that's going to put you, that's going to be the difference of you. So, so like, let's say you have nothing negative on your credit report, nothing negative, all your credit cards are maxed out. You're going to be at a 600. As soon as you pay off all your debt, you're going to go into the 740, 730 bracket. And, and it, it could be a different, and the, the great thing is it doesn't matter if you have a hundred dollar credit card with a $10 balance, it's going to affect you the same way as a $1,000 credit card and a $100 balance. It's all about the percentage. So some people might say, oh, well, I only have a $200 secure credit card. There's only $100 on there. Yeah, but you're at 50% utilization. So somebody with a $10,000 credit card can have 1000 and they're in a better position because their utilization for that credit card is lower than your utilization, even though the debt is more. If that makes sense. It's crazy how it makes, how the game sense. It makes yeah. perfect sense. And I'm so happy that you're sharing this because, yeah. you know, most people would think, hey, I got a $500 credit card or I got a $1,500 um, credit limit rather. But, you know, I max out or maybe I do about $800 a month on it. You would think that you're doing better than somebody who has a $10,000 credit card who's putting $1,000 a month on it. You know, I'm I'm so happy you're bringing these points up because I didn't realize it it was weighed that way. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely weighed by the percentage, not by the amount that you have. Like, I have a client that has, like, maybe, like, I have one client in particular, he has, like, $300,000 in credit card debt. I'm sorry, in credit card available credit. So if he puts – he can put $50,000 on one of his cards and his utilization is still fine. Even though it's fifty grand, mm-hmm. he's still good. Now you have somebody that has, like I said, it's always it's it's usually people that have a low limit that usually tend to max it out, and then not they're not able to catapult to that next level because they always are used to like just small limits, just three hundred, four hundred, five hundred, and they put five hundred dollars on. It's like, man, my credit score is not going up. Yeah, it's because you just have the wrong cards. That's all it is. You just have the wrong cards. Let's stick to cards for a second. Mm-hmm. Are there any cards that are better or worse for you in terms of building credit? So we see, you know, obviously you see the Visas, the MasterCards, the mm-hmm. Capital Ones. They, they, they pump, a, you know, American Express, they pump a lot of money into marketing and promotion. Mm-hmm. Are there any that I should be seeking out that is going to help me overall or are they all the same? So once you get to like, you know, if you get like a secure credit card and you get past the point where you you don't have to really put any money down to apply for credit cards, which is like a deposit, you know, you want to go to like the Capital Ones, the the Chase, the American Express. Once you, Chase and American Express, once you get to like 700, 720 to maximize your credit limit available, you know, you, you might have a 680 with no negative items, apply for American Express or Chase, maybe get a two, three thousand dollar limit. But if you get 720, 730 credit score, that could be the difference if you're getting a fifteen or twenty thousand dollar limit. You know what I mean? So when your credit is 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 really good and you're getting there, American Express, Chase, those are the cards that you really want to navigate towards because now you get rewards. Now you can start traveling for free. You can get hotels for free. You get free meals. You get Uber credits, things like that. But the cards to stay away from um, is, I don't know if you've ever heard of them, it's called Credit One Bank and no. then First Premier Bank. So you have these cards, what they're going to do is they're going to approve you for a credit card. As soon as they approve you for the credit card, 
they're going to tack on a $75 annual fee on it, right? right? As soon as you get the card. So now you're getting the card thinking you have 300 available, but you only have 225. Now you spend a hundred dollars on it. Now you have $175. Now you're almost maxed out already. And then now you, you, you make a $25 payment, which is the minimum, but now you have a, a 30%, you know, 27% interest rate. So now the $25 payment you just made doesn't matter because they just tacked on $30 worth interest and, and you can never escape that hole. You know what I mean? Like a little hamster running in a circle because now that's as soon as they tack on that $75, it's like you're, you're already, it's, it's a trap. It's in. And then they'll charge you every month. Even if you don't use the card, like first premier and credit one, I think it's like eight to $10 a month. Even if you don't use the card, $8, $10, eight dollars. Next thing you know, in a year, that's over a hundred bucks. That's a yeah. hundred dollars. Yeah. Now you have first, you, and the thing is, they're like, hey, you, you've done so good with us. We're going to offer you another first premiere with no $75, but they're still charging you $10 a month. Now you have a credit one card. Oh, you've done so good. We're going to give you another credit one. Next thing you know, you're paying $40 to $50 a month in just fees to just have the cards. Multiply that by 12. You're talking about almost $600 a year in just fees to just have the cards open where you could have put that somewhere else. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Say I'm doing well. I'm paying back, um, you know, I'm paying my bills on time. How do I go about getting a credit line increase? Uh, how, you know, is it simple as calling them? Do, is it anything that I need to do in particular to get my credit increase? Yep. I would say call. You could do it through the app um, or online. You know, usually if you go to settings and your credit score, I, so before you apply for a credit limit increase, there's one thing I always tell people. Number two, make sure there's no late payment with any of your credit card companies in the last six months and make sure you have pretty good low utilization. So um, you don't have to have excellent credit to get a limit increase, but you do want to have good credit in the sense where there's nothing negative in the last six months and you, your credit cards aren't maxed out. And instead of going on your phone to, to apply for the limit increase through the app or whatever, you, you guessed it, call them. I, like, the phone is your best friend. Give them a call and say, hey, and this is a script you can use. So if you wanna, you know, this is a script you guys can use. I, I use this all the time for myself and clients. And you can say, hey, how you doing? I'm calling about my account, giving me information what the case is. And say, yeah, so I've been a client of your, I've been a customer with, you know, Credit One, I mean, with Capital One, American Express Chase, you know, for about three years now. And, um, you know, I, I really do appreciate the, the value that this card has. It's allowed me to be able to travel. It's allowed me to be able to do a lot of things. I wanted to see if you can actually look into my account and see if I'm eligible for a credit limit increase. So that way I can continue using this card and benefit from the great uh, rewards that it has. So that way I can recommend you to my friends and family. Right. You say that over the phone, they're going to be like, OK, well, let me see. Well, what kind of limit were you thinking of? They always didn't ask you that. Well, what limit were you thinking of? You know, currently right now you have about a three thousand dollar limit. You know, well, actually, I was kind of look, hopefully trying to get like a six or seven thousand dollar limit. You know, but can you see if I can maybe be eligible for a ten thousand, you know, um, and, and see what we can get? If we can get ten thousand, that would be great. It would really help me out a lot. Like you kill them with kindness, you know. And, and just that little script right there, they're gonna be like, hey, Mr. Rodriguez, well, we tried to approve you for a 10,000, but unfortunately, we were only able to approve you for a 7,000 for right now. You can check with us in about six months to a year to get something else. And that's it. You know, you call them over the phone, you get a live person on the phone, they're, they're gonna do more than a computer with Trump. Because if you put on the phone and you just put like, I want a limit increase and you don't put an actual amount, they might only improve you 500. It's not enough. You know what I mean? So they will run your credit though, Sean. That's the one thing I want people to understand. With a credit limit increase, they usually will run your credit, but it's okay. The limit that you're going to get is going to supersede the one inquiry. Now, oh, good. If, you have, if you have three credit cards and you try to get a limit increase on one of them and they decline you, don't do the other two because now you're going to have three inquiries. Three. With, you know what I mean? But if they approve you on the first one, good. Maybe go for a second one a week later and then the third one. But six months um, to a year, every six months to a year, Sean, make sure that you're calling each of your credit card companies and put a reminder in your phone to always get a limit increase because you can start with $5,000 of available credit between all your credit cards in 2015. Next thing you know, 
and 2020, you've called them six months to a year religiously. Now you're at 50. Now you're at 60. Now you're at 70 because every year you're getting, you're asking them for a limit increase because you're demonstrating good positive payment history and, and low debt utilization. So that's where you want to be. And then in 2025, you'll be at a hundred thousand. And then 20, 20, 2030, you'll be at over, you know, 150, 200. And that's really where you want to try to get to. I, you know, this such great information because this goes against uh, what I would consider to just be just common, uh, a common thought process. I would never think to call a credit card company every six months mm-hmm. to ask for a credit increase. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'd be actually too worried to do that myself, thinking that, hey, it's actually going to hurt my credit or put me in bad standings you know, to go and, and try to increase my credit every six months. So that's right. just great information. Mm-hmm. You, off the top of your head, what are some of the most common mistakes that people make when trying to fix their credit? Like why they come to me or during the process? To start with why they come to you and then speak to, to during the process. I would say the biggest thing that I see people doing is is um, utilities like cable companies, phone companies, and medical bills. Those are, those are two of the biggest things that we see. Somebody might have paid, forgot to pay a progressive account, um, Geico, you know, maybe a gym membership, or a medical bill from 10 years ago because they moved or whatever the case is. So two of the things that people can do, because I, like I always like to talk about the bad, but then I would like to give you a good thing to fix it so you could so you cannot do that. Is um, you know, if, if you honestly don't know if you owe Verizon, T Mobile, or anybody money and you know you've had an account, I'm always preaching proactiveness or being proactive. Call them. If you were if you know you had a T Mobile account six years ago and it's not on your credit report, guess what? Call T Mobile and say, Hey, I think I had an account with you like five years ago. I'm just making sure that everything is good with you guys, you know. I'm in a better position now. I just moved or whatever the case is. They're going to ask you for your social date of birth. Nope, everything is good. You actually will call up. Oh, you know what? Actually, you actually have a $50 balance with us. Would you like to take care of that? Because you know what's going to happen? You're going to try to move. That $50 collection account is going to pop up on your credit report. It's going to drop your credit score 100 bucks. You're going to have to pay a company like me to get it off. And remember, you're, now you're investing. It's like So it's like I always tell people, Call if you don't know if you owe T Mobile money, but you had T Mobile, call T Mobile, call Sprint, call Verizon, call the cable company, call the electric company because we see it happen all the time. People will come to us, they, they, they were pre approved for a house. Next thing you know, right before closing, boom, a hundred dollar Sprint bill shows up, a $30 uh, T you know, uh, medical bill or something like that comes up. Just call them and just take care of it. Is money you owed might be something with it. Now, if it's not yours, then obviously don't pay it. And, and there's ways to get around that. But then medical bills, people have fifty dollars co payments they didn't pay. Ah, I'm not paying that. They they go to like LabCorp and don't pay the fifteen dollar copay, or or they go to the emergency room. They'll get a bill and they're like, I got insurance. I'm not going to take it. Whatever. They they can figure it out. Next thing you know, you have all these medical bills in your credit report. Just call your call them up and say, Hey, I have insurance. Here's a copy of my card. If, if people did those two things, honestly, I probably would have like 75% less clients. Wow. You know what I mean? and, and I tell people all the time, you, it's, it's, it's time. It's really all that it is. It's just taking the time to be proactive before any of that stuff happens. Because now when they come to me, we're being reactive. We're reacting to now the negative stuff. So it's like, that's what I'm in business for is to help people through those problems. But if you just take the time to do it, you wouldn't need somebody like me. And, and then while they're in the program, the thing that people do is they either max out their credit cards or they make late payments. So if we delete five items from your credit report and you're still late or you're maxing out your credit cards, your score is not going to go up. So we could delete whatever we want, but your score is not going to progress because you're, you're still adding negative data every single month to your credit report. Let me ask you something. It, 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 and this is a, a a situation that I know happens to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Let's say you made, uh, you spoke about Verizon, you spoke about the utility companies out there. Mm-hmm. 
You call them up, you pay off whatever you owe, and you think you're good. You think that's where it ends. But so many people look at their credit report and things that they paid off years ago are still showing up. So what is the process to make sure that any of us who get caught in a bad situation, what can we do to make sure that these companies are removing some of these negative marks and or infractions against us from these overall credit bureaus? So now this is probably one of the only times you hear me say, unfortunately, is just because you pay a collection that's on your credit report or a negative account, it's not going to be removed from your credit report unless you have an agreement with that collection agency before you pay it that is going to come off. Because um, there's like another, now, like I said, I like to educate, right? So there's a, there's a, there's a, a place called the Consumer Data Industry Association, which is a CDIA. Every year they come out with uh, like a manual, right? A credit reporting resources guide, the CRRG. And they have pretty much like a guideline as to how furnishers or people that report information to the credit bureaus are supposed to act, right? So it's kind of like, these are the guidelines. If you want to report information to the credit bureaus, here's what you got to follow. Here's the, here's, the, here's the rules and regulations in order to comply with us and the Fair Credit Reporting Act and Metro 2 standards, right? So I know I'm throwing a lot of stuff out there, but I just like to, so, so, so that way people, when they hear it, they're going to Google it, they're going to look it up, and they're going to research it as well. That's why I say those names. So now, if you're a collection agency and you have an agreement with Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion, you're pretty much letting them know that, hey, if Jose pays this collection account, I will not remove it just because it's paid. The only way that I will remove it, if it's inaccurate or if it's not theirs as a result of fraud. So brings up a point to where a, a paid collection account could be reporting inaccurate. How? Let's say if on Equifax it shows paid, but then Experian TransUnion shows unpaid and you dispute it, it comes back verified. That's inaccurate because now they're reporting an inaccurate balance after you paid it. But just because you paid it, you can't call the credit bureaus or the collection and you say, hey, I paid you guys. You have to remove it. Well, you paid it, right? Yes. So we're reporting accurate information by this account having a zero balance. You know what I mean? So okay. it's so, crazy. It's no, crazy. it really is, which leads me to my next question. What the hell would I pay him for? If this thing's going to stay on my credit report for the next seven years, whether I pay him or don't pay him, yep. why would I want to pay this off if they're not going to remove it from my credit report? So another great question is because that's in the, in the beginning where I said we try to remove whatever we can and whatever we can't remove, we want you to pay it because even if it doesn't come off your credit report, your data is still going to be better because now you, you might only have one or two paid collections on your credit report or a paid repossession or a paid charge off, whatever the case is. When you go apply for a credit card or a mortgage or a car, they're going to look at your credit report and say, all right, well, this person has a collection, but it's paid. The risk is lower. The risk is a lot less. So you still want to try to satisfy that debt, even if you've exhausted all means with trying to get it off, because um, you're, 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 you're going to be in a better position down the road by showing paid stuff then open stuff that's negative and it's going to continue to ding your credit score because now you, you could have continuously negative data reporting every month with an open balance. So I would still hundred percent advocate, even if it's not going to come off your credit report, pay it. If you're not able to get it deleted by disputing the inaccuracy of the account, because what's going to happen, Sean is, I don't know. I think in New York is the same way as New Jersey. They can sue you for that debt. Now you have a judgment and that judgment is renewable every 20 years. So let's say if you have a thousand dollar credit card, you didn't pay it, it gets charged off, and now it goes into a collection account. You didn't pay the collection account. Now six, now you're at year six. At year six, they can sue you. You have a judgment, and if you don't pay it, it could be 
valid for up to 20 years. So now you're talking about a thousand dollar account from 25, 26 years ago. That's still open and valid. And I've seen it happen with people from debt from their late nineties that they're getting sued for. You know what I mean? Um, because it's still open that they, they sued them back in the nineties or the, now it's the early two thousands and the debt is still valid because you were sued for it and you didn't contest it when it was sued. So that's why I tell people to pay it if it's not able to get deleted because it's gonna cost you more money down the road with getting your bank account levied, getting your, gar your wages garnished if you get sued. You won't be able to buy a house with collections that are open. If, you, if you're trying to get a car, they're not gonna give you a car if you have a collection account for 50 bucks for a medical bill. You, you know, believe it or not, your interest is gonna be either 7%, 5%, or 1920 because you're at risk, because you have a collection. So that's why we tell people to pay it, Sean, even if it's not going to come off. And that's good advice. A lot of credit repair companies are going to tell you, man, don't pay it. We'll keep fighting it. We'll keep fighting it. You're fighting it for three years. And you, you, you're, 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 you're fighting it for three years, getting higher interest rates, getting higher interest rates, spending thousands and thousands and thousands of money. It, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Understood. I'm a man. And I know that there are a lot of men around this country who right now are trying to keep a roof over their family's head. But in the interim, they can't pay child support. Mm -hmm. Is child support payments, I know it's not deferred, mm -hmm. but just with this CARES Act, and I should have asked you this earlier in the, in the conversation, are there anything put in place for people who are, are, are struggling to survive but can't make the full payments on child support? Or does the interest keep adding up and they keep going into arrears and there's nothing put in place to help people who just legitimately can't pay? Right. That, that's going to be more of um, a question that they will have to kind of like contact their case manager or their court because the thing is, a lot, of collect, a lot of child support accounts don't automatically report to the credit bureaus, right? So not every single child support account reports. It's usually when you go into default like two or three times and you're in arrears, that's usually when I see it, that it goes on after kind of like defaulting a few times on it. Um, but there is nothing, as far as I know, as far as the protection with child support, which is unfortunate because obviously – you know, you're not working, uh, you lose your job. At that point is where you got to contact the court and let them know, hey, listen, I lost my job because of COVID. I can't make these payments. And, and you're going to have to keep that open communication if you have a relationship with, with the baby moms and say, hey, I'm out of work. Like, I, there's only so much I can do. Can you help me out here? And, and that's why having a great relationship, which I said in the beginning, open communication with all types of relationships can also protect your credit because, you don't want to fall into a thing where it's like, now, damn, I wasn't able to make payments on my child support. Now it's on my credit. It's messed up. You know what I mean? There's definitely ways. I had I had a few clients ask me that. Um, and, all, and all I've been telling them was to contact, like, you know, their the court and the case manager and see if there's something they can do to prevent it from, from going on their credit report and or preventing the late payments from showing up if they're not able to make it because of unemployment. Got you. Let's say... I'm in default um, and I've been in default for years mm -hmm. and going backwards into, into the conversation, you were saying, you know, Sean, it's just better to pay these people off. Even if you can't get it removed from your report, mm -hmm. should I call and try to at least get the maybe interest removed or the principal reduced because it's so old and they'll just take, you know, they'll be willing to make a deal at that point. Or if they make a deal, does it reflect poorly or even more poorly on my credit report? So I always advocate 100% to settle the debt for less than what it is. Um, it's going to make or break somebody's situation because if you owe a $20,000 debt and they, they want to settle for twelve hundred, which we've seen, Take it. You know what I mean? Take that $200. But does that hurt me more? Does it hurt? Is it, is it, it in doesn't. any way hurting me? 
it does. So there's a verbiage that goes on the credit report that says settled for less than paid, you know, settled for less than paid in full, or, you know, it'll have the verbiage on it say settled for less, yeah, settled for less than paid in full or whatever. Um, that verbiage will be seen by other creditors, but if you don't got it, you don't got it. I always tell people settle because if you can save a few thousand dollars, few, you know, it's better. Yeah, the verbiage is going to be on the credit report. It's not so much going to hurt your credit score, but it is going to be on there as far as the verbiage on that on that account. But it's going to still look better than unpaid. You know what I mean? So the only thing that I tell people with settlements is that there's there's a chance that they can issue what's called a 1099C, which is a cancellation of debt, and you would have to report that as income. Since you brought that question up, uh, a lot of people have to understand, let's say if you have a $10,000 credit card that, you, that, that, that was charged off or whatever the case is, you settled for $2,000, there is a possibility that that credit card company can issue you a 1099 and you would have to report that other $8,000 that you saved as income. You know what I mean? There's a high likely possibility of that happening. You would just have to ask the credit card company, hey, if I settle this debt, are you guys going to issue me a 1099 for the remainder of the balance? They're going to either say no or yes. If it's older, they might not do it. If it's newer, they might issue that 1099. And that just means that you got to pay taxes on it at, at the end of the year, but it's still going to be a lot less than you paying that full amount. We see people in our community all the time asking, you know, let's say they want to get a car, their first car. Um, they want to get into an apartment. Mm -hmm. They come and they ask you, can you co-sign for me? What are the risks of being that co-signee? And does it affect my credit just as poorly as it would affect the person who actually took out the loan? I guess I'll end it there. Would it affect me the same way that it would affect them? Yes. Same way. Same way. So with that, what we usually tell people is, let's say um, I'm going to take me and my brother for, for an example, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say my brother comes up to me and says, hey, Jose, um, I want this car. Can you co-sign for me? Or I want this apartment. Can you co-sign for me? And if I know that my brother's credit and his history is not really, you know, good, you're better off by being the only person on that account and having your brother pay you or having my brother pay me. So for instance, I'm going to use two examples, the apartment. Let's say if my brother's like, yo, man, I really need to, I really need to get this apartment. I got to move, whatever the case is. Can you co-sign for me? You can say no, but, and, and, and there's no other way. And it's your family, whatever the case is. And, and there's just, you know, you, you're guilty and you, don't, you, you, know, you want to help him out. I always advocate for not co-signing, but if you have to, with all means, this is the way you should do it. You should tell him, all right, I'm going to be the main person on the apartment and you're going to be the resident because you know what's going to happen. Now you you know when it's being paid because your my brother is going to have to pay me and I'm going to pay. So I'm going to know like, yo, bro, the fifth of the month, you got to pay me. If you just have to be ready to make that payment if he's not going to make it. So when you co-sign, or when you're a co-borrower, co you have to assume responsibility. So before you co-sign for your sibling or whatever, you have to know, all right, and just in case he doesn't make the payment, I got to be ready to make it. But the, the, the thing where it's going to protect you is it's going to be better if you know that he doesn't pay you month one. Your brother's not going to tell you that he didn't make the payment. Next thing you know, six months down the road, he's getting evicted. You guys are going to argue. He's going to... um. He's going to have some, a collection account on his credit report. You're going to get sued. Now you're screwed. You know what I mean? It's better to say, I'm the, I'm the owner of the apartment. Hey, man, listen, if you don't have my rent money by, by the next month, sorry, bro, but I got to rent it out of somebody else. I, gotta, I, I can't have it because I, don't, I can't keep making these payments for you. And then now you could rent it out to somebody else or tell them, hey, listen, if you get a roommate, you guys can split the, split the payment, whatever the case is you'll be better in that situation. Now, with the apartment, and the thing is, if your credit is better than my brother's, if my, my credit, it's a less, um, less security deposit, usually, right? Because they base security deposit off of credit. So if 
his credit is bad and my credit is good and I'm the co-signer, they're still going off of his credit for the secured deposit. So now he's paying more. So, hey, listen, I'm going to do, I'm going to save you 3000 2000 whatever it is, but make the payments to me and I'll make them. The same thing for the car. If my brother wants a car and he's like, yo, can you co-sign for me? I'm going to say, no, I'm going to get the car under my name because it doesn't matter whether you co-sign or not. It's still going to go on both of your credit report, right? So you can say, all right, I'm going to get the car. My credit is better, so I'm going to have less interest, less down payment. My brother will give me the money, and then I'll make the payment. God forbid my brother is not able to pay it. Now I can sell the car. You know what I mean? I can sell the car and be good, and then my relationship with my brother is still intact, and it's not as bad because now he's not going to tell you that he's not making payments, especially if you're not up to it. Now, you, next thing you know, you have a repo and an eviction. Your credit is screwed because of somebody else which you don't want. You know what I mean? I know that's a long explanation for it, but that's how I like to explain no, it. No, I, 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 I love it. I, I, I love that you are given this much insight. Yeah. I love it. Before we close out, Jose, you mentioned earlier that with the CARES Act, the, the student loans were automatically deferred. Did I get that correct? Yes, sir. Yep. When you say that they're deferred, does that in, does that also increase include excuse me any interest that's yes. being compiled month over month? Yep. So interest and payments have been deferred and stopped until December, which is great. So that's in a sense from April to December. That's about eight months of interest not accruing. So I still when we you know when I made the post in my client group, I told my clients. If you can still make your payments because now it's all going, it's, you know, not all of it, but more of it's going to principal because now interest is not accruing. Correct. So you're, you're in a better spot. So I would definitely still advocate it, but yeah, it's, it's interest and payments deferred until December 20, uh, 2020. Student loans, stick into that for one second. Student mm -hmm. loans jam up so many people from our community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you might have taken out $10,000, but now you owe $50,000 over the years. Yep. Is that interest something that these institutions will forego or will they work with you if you're willing to start making payments? Or is it just, you know, they're like, no, we're going to keep beating up your credit because yeah. you can ask me, you correct me if I'm wrong. I know in most cases, after seven years, things leave your credit report. That doesn't correct. apply with student loans. You, federal you, you, student loans, correct. Federal no, student doesn't. loans, correct. Yes. That's on your credit for as long as you owe. So yeah. it's not like you can dodge them. But mm -hmm. will they work with you? Because so, you know, people are paying more in interest than they actually have in, in, in terms of the principal. So what I usually tell people to do, because student loan debt is, I advocate college. Go to college, get your degree. You know, I do not advocate for people not getting the degree. But student loan debt could be a trap if you go to college, you change the degree, defer payments, defer Because remember, every time you defer, you're still accruing interest. And that's where people don't realize it. So now you get out of college, just like you said, that 10000 turns into a lot more. Um, and then people just don't, the biggest mistake that people make with student loans is they just don't pay them. There's so many resources out there, even without COVID, um, you can go into what's called a forbearance plan. If you are face, facing financial hardship, you can uh, put your student loans into a financial forbearance, still going to accrue interest, but at least you're not making monthly payments and it's reporting positive on your student loans. Now, we tell everyone to, to go to a, a website. It's called Student Loans. So just like how I say it, studentloans.gov, .gov. So student loans with an S at the end of loans, .gov, .gov. And what you can do is with your federal student loans, you can consolidate your student loans, uh, whether they're negative or whether they're in good standing, and put it into one payment. The great thing about this, Sean, is that you can do it based off of your income. So let's say if you're, you went to law school, 
you have $200,000 student loans. You come out, you know what? I couldn't get a job as an attorney. I'm working at Wawa. I'm working so-and-so. I'm only making $25,000 a year. You consolidate your loans into an income-based payment plan, and it's going to base it off of your $25,000 a year, and then now you don't got to make a payment. Well, a lot of people, well, I see it all the time, and the reason why I say attorneys is, or attorneys and doctors, they have the most student loan debt, and I see it happen a lot where they just don't pay them, and next thing you know, you try to go buy a house, you can't because you haven't paid your student loans in four or five years. Exactly. You know what I mean? I, and, and even with teacher, I see it happen a lot with teachers too. They come out, they have you know, the student loan debt. So if you go to studentloans.gov, you can consolidate and refinance your student loans into one payment. Right now, if, if you're, if you're um, in good standing, don't worry about it because you don't got to make payments anyway. But if you're in negative standing, if you're in default, you have negative, you know, you have collections and student loans, you go to this website, you consolidate them, you get them out of negative standing, you put them into one loan, and now that's actually helping you build your credit, and then you don't got to start making payments until December because they're deferred. You know what I mean? So student loan debt is a tr it's crazy. I feel bad sometimes when I see how much student loan debt people have, but when you go into an income-based payment, and as long as you do it for 10 years, they usually will forgive all or some of the, the rest of the loan. So that's why it's important to do income base uh, because they will forgive some of your loan as long as you commit to a 10 year uh, income based payment. Okay. Let me make sure I was going to let that go until you said that last part. Yeah. If you go into an income based payment, you say you're making $25,000 a year, but you can only afford to put a thousand dollars a month toward your student loan. Mm -hmm. which you actually owe $200,000. Mm -hmm. In some cases, you're saying, hey, if you pay on time for 10 years, they will forgive the rest of that $200,000? Did I understand that correctly? Yep. So you, ha you have to go into an income-based payment. Um, but if you're only making $25,000 a year, there's no way that you would be paying $1,000 a month if you owe $200,000 to the loan. Your payment might be zero. Like we've seen it where people's payments are actually zero based off of their income. Um, now every year you have to recertify. You have to recertify every year. So if you start making more money, you might have to start making payments. But um, you know, when you go to studentloans.gov, there's like a little calculator on there and you can see it that where if you do an income-based payment, you make payments for X amount and they'll forgive the rest. You know what I mean? And um, this, will not, this will not reflect poorly, negatively on no, your credit report. Not at all. Wow. Yeah, this is one of the things that we started doing for clients uh, at no cost um, because we're not a student loan consolidation company. So, you know, we're not a licensed student loan consolidation company. So we just assist our clients with doing it. So they don't got to pay. Like you could even Google it. Student loan consolidation companies charge 800, 900, is, is crazy. It's another industry that we just want to change. So we just do it for free. If you're a client of ours, we do it for free. And if, if you're not a client of ours, you go to studentloans.gov and you can do it for yourself. And it actually helps your credit because now you're getting this negative student loans out of negative standing, putting them in positive standing and making payments, putting them in income-based payment. And it's, it's amazing because now you'll be eligible if you're trying to get an FHA, FHA mortgage and you owe student loans, it's not happening. It's not happening. Jose, you've been a wealth of information, man. I have personally learned so much. Uh, awesome. I, you know, even as I was coming into this interview, I, I didn't expect to learn awesome. as much as you have taught me. So I'm sure there's somebody, um, there are going to be many people who listen to this interview and they're going to really be educated. Awesome. If people want your services. Where can they find you? So I always, I always tell people to go to one place, Instagram. I'm the credit dude on Instagram. So it's just spelled out the credit dude, D U D E. And the reason why I tell people to go on there is I want you to know who I am and I want you to kind of see the work that I've done and who, who I kind of am around uh, before you make a decision with scheduling a call with us. There's a lot of credit repair companies out there, and I know it. You could just Google it, and you can find someone. Um, but hopefully, with the knowledge that I gave you, you won't need me. But if you do need me, um, go on my Instagram, 
look look at uh, my stories. Look, I'm a family man. A, a lot of my employees, I share a lot of their stuff too. Um, and you can get to know me a little bit. And if you feel like you're comfortable and you feel like, you know what, I want to give this guy a chance. Um, I always tell people, just trust me 1% and I'm going to earn the other 99. It's one of the models that I've lived uh, ever since I started my credit repair company. Um, and just click the link in my bio on Instagram and we'll schedule a free consultation where we can just go over, your, you know, go over any questions you have and things like that and then discuss what your options could be with our company. Jose, man, you've been a wealth of information. I thank you so much for, for your insight, your knowledge, your wisdom, and just overall your willingness to share. Yes, you sir. are a true power move maker. Thank you, thank brother. You, thank you. I appreciate that, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.